So I'll be talking about improved um, field random generators for unordered for unordered branching programs and um, so this is joint work with um, Uya Hatami and Avishaital, um, Uya Hatami, Omer Rengold and Avishaital. So um, let's I'm sure all of you know what branching programs are, but still let's start out with um, introducing branching programs. So this is a model of computation where you want to capture space bounded algorithms. So for this talk, we'll always, um, by branching programs, we'll refer to read once branching programs. And further, they're oblivious, so the order in which they read the bits is fixed, and it's also read once. So it's modeled by a layered graph So the parameters are its width, its w, and since it's read once, um, its length is n. There's a start node, and without loss of generality, let's just assume there is one accept node. Further, each layer is labeled by some variable, some input variable. So let's assume it's, you know, you know the order of reads, so it's say x1, x2 through xn. And from each, um, each node, there are two edges which go out. One is labeled by zero and the other by one. And for any input x, you s the branching program computes in the following way, that it starts here, depending on the value of x1, it takes the corresponding edge out and keeps going, and it accepts if it, um, if it ends up in this node, and otherwise it rejects. So this is a Boolean function b, this branching program which takes which takes n bit strings to zero or one, right? It's a Boolean function. And um, so this variety is called the ordered. So again, we'll be talking about oblivious read once branching programs. And where you know the order of read, so we'll call these branching programs as ordered branching programs. And the other variety, which is actually what I'll be talking about, is um, unordered branching programs where, um, again, it's oblivious and read once, but you just do not know in which order you're, you do not know when you're reading which bit, yes. For any order. Right, so ah, okay. So, yeah. So, so it's actually with you know x one dictates which 
So this is the state of the machine, right? So width w corresponds to a uh, space log w machine, right? So and then depending upon its state and the input bit, it you know goes to a different state, right? And it accepts after reading all its bits, right? So this is the model of computation that we'll be concerned with, and yeah. And by unordered, you just know what what layer is labeled with which input bit. All right. So and the next basic notion that we'll need here is. Um, that of a pseudo random generator. So this this is a very well known um, object in theoretical computer science, and it's used in the following way that you want to. So it's a function which takes d bits and stretches it to. n bits, so it's it's indexed by n. So for every n, you want a pseudo random generator, and this is defined against a class of functions. So for our talk, I'll not. Um, so for our talk, we'll be trying to develop pseudo random generators for the class of unordered branching programs. And what you would want is that for any for any b that is where b is an unordered branching program of length n you'd want expected value of b of x and x is drawn from the uniform distribution minus the expected value of b of g of y when y is drawn from <coughs> the uniform distribution on d bits to be bounded by epsilon. And so D is the seed length of the generator. And you'd want to get D as small as possible. So for example, if you have D which is log n, then you actually de-randomize space bounded computation. Because you could just go over all the seeds and if the error is small enough, then you can just take the majority. captures yeah, a Turing machine with um, with a random tip which it reads just it's a read once it's a one sided read yeah. So instead of so uniform, you are yes. Sir. At least um, in our work, it's very heavily dependent on targeting the uniform distribution. It may be switch.
I don't know if there is any work which, yeah, all right, so, okay, so these are the two basic things we'll be talking about, and um, uh, yeah, I was trying that, but it doesn't, <laughs> it does, oh, maybe I should press it hard enough, yeah. Right, some um, some history of what's known here um, for BRGs for branching programs. Well, this has been an intensive line of study, and I'll just mention some some work. Um, so, so the two settings are the ordered branching programs and the. Engine programs. Here, um, there's the seminal work of Nissan from 91, which gives zero random generators for branching programs with seed length log square n plus log n. And there has been a key. Right. Um, yeah. So. So there's a W here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Um, yeah. So for this talk, um, think of W as constant. So it's yeah. Um, <coughs> And there has been a lot of work to um, improve this, but unfortunately, um, we have not been able to get better PRGs in this setting. Yeah, so they shave off. But that's a hitting set, right? Yeah. It's a hitting set. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So for zero random generators, still this is the best thing known, and um, so there have been some improvements where you assume uh, more structure on the branching program. For example, if you look just at uh, so if you look at the graph between two layers, and so from each node there are like two things two edges coming out, right? So if this graph between um, layers, say, V1 and VI and VI plus 1, if this is a regular graph, then there have been um, improvements, actually. Um, the work of Breverman, Rao, Rav, and And also, Roddy Verben, they get tilled off. Log n, again, I'm hiding the epsilon factors here. And this was, I think, for, so if you assume even more that um, for every 
every node there is a zero edge and a one edge coming in and it's also regular. And such programs are called as permutation branching programs and then for that um, there's work of Kauchki, Nimborker and Pudluck which actually gets you order log n times log one over epsilon but for a constant epsilon it's order log n. No. So yeah, the dependence on width is really bad. I think it's like um, W factorial, and then on India they improved it to W power eight, I think. So, so, so yeah, constant width has been. So some of this work have they have focused on constant width. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so for unordered branching programs. It turns out that the bench work, benchmark was very different. So, so the first work which gets seat length below n is by this work of um, Bogdanov, uh, Papa, Constantino, and Wen. where they get seed length one minus omega one times n. So slightly smaller than n. And, um, but they can handle pretty large width, it's two power almost. Um, n to the omega one kind of width. And then improving this, there is um, a really nice work of Impaglia, so uh, Mecca and Zuckerman from 2012, I think, which gets seed length slightly larger than square root n. And again, this work actually handles um, slightly more general branching programs, so they can handle branching programs which can read um, input bits multiple, so arbitrary branching programs. These, they need not be read once or oblivious. But, um, so the general result is if the size of the branching program is S, they get seed length S power half plus little of one. If you plug this in for a regular branching program, you get NW power half plus little of one, and for constant W, the same thing. And um, okay, I'll just plug it in like this. And recently, there has been some more progress. So, um, it's the work of Reingold, Steinke, and and Vadan. So this work handles permutation branching programs in the unordered setting, and they get seed length, which is log square n, so it's poly dependence in W. So this is for permutation branching program. And finally, the last work I want to mention is by Steinke, Vadan, and Andrew Wan in 14, where they handle width three. So read once unordered branching programs of width three, and they get seed length log cube n. So for constant width, general branching programs, before I worked, the best known was, best known PRG is Impaya, so Mecca and Zuckerman, which gives square root n, slightly larger than square root n. All right, so. I 
issue. So, our main result is on pseudorandom generators is so far width w read once. So, width w unordered read once branching programs. The seed length we get is order log log n. So, this is uh, okay. So, if you want a more precise statement then it is Yes, so yeah, that is a good point. So, the one of the motivations for studying these unordered is um, the way most of almost all of the works in the ordered setting have. Um, so, most of the constructions in the ordered setting is by this general principle where, um, okay, let me say the. So, it is a very nice observation that. Suppose you have a branching program and you know the order of read and it is a read once branching program. Now, if you use say r uniform bits here, yeah, a seed of length r, so what is the intuition of building ordered branching program? So, if you if you use seed length r here to walk say for half of the branching program and the width is say 2 power s, where s you should think of as the space of the branching program. Then if you condition on which node you have reached after this walk, if you condition on that with high probability you would expect that um, you still have r minus s bits of entropy left in this string. So, the idea is now use a seeded extractor with a new seed and extract this amount of uniform bits. So, and reuse it in this part of the walk. That is again logarithm. That is logarithmic. So, right, and you recurve strongly. Yeah. So, mm, yeah, I do not know. So, I think the one main motivation of uh, studying unordered is that, um, so it seems like with these kind of approaches and with recursion it seems really hard. So, I cannot say it is impossible, but it is really hard to bit log square n. So, if you probably develop a PRG which does this, which is not based on, so this principle cannot, I mean there is no, this analysis does not go through if it is unordered because you do not know what to condition on and extract. So, 
it's just, I think it's a mind game so that you can come up with uh, different PRGs. So anything for unordered, unordered is also a PRG for ordered, so it's a different pseudorandom generator for ordered branches. So the read cake case. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think there is some work of Nissan from the 90s which shows that if you allow read cake access, it's. The random mixer? Yeah, the right. Ah, so, so there's this paper called read once versus read k for space. Like if you act, if you allow the tape to go forward and back, then I think you show some separation right there. Yeah. Different pseudo random generators, right? Because right now, even for with three branching programs, the best known PRGs for log square, and so, so it would be nice to come up with some different PRGs. All right, so right, and um, the main structural result that we use for coming up with this PRG is a bound on the Fourier spectrum of branching programs, which I think is interesting. And it resolves a conjecture by um, um, Steinke, Rengold, and Bada. So the result on Fourier spectrum this. So B is a Boolean function and we are talking about its Fourier spectrum. So for any S which is a subset of M, we define B hat of S to be so X is sampled from the uniform distribution of <coughs> B of X summation of psi where i is in. So it's a correlation with the parity which corresponds to x. Yeah, b is a, it's a standard for yeah. yeah. And what we prove is that all k in, in 1 through n, this bound holds. Yes, so b is, uh, yeah, so, so for both of this, this is common, so it's width w unordered branch mixer. So for the Fourier spectrum, you can see that for this quantity, it doesn't matter that it's ordered or unordered, so. And um, so the conjecture was, that it's order log n power sum order w times of order w of k. And we prove this. And what we conjecture is that this should be w minus 2. So if I think if you can get w minus 2 probably for width 3, you probably can get below or you get log 4. But OK, so there is there are some ways probably you can go to below log square and for width 3. Um, all right. So note that um, this is pretty tight so far. So one standard example in the setting is the tribes function, which is
subscribe says you have an OR gate and AND gets on disjoint sets of variables here. So, so roughly think of this as 2 power w, this is w and there are w, wait I should not have used w in this, um, say maybe r and 2 power r. You can show that this is roughly balanced and so so each of this corresponds to a block or a tribe and if unanimously they say one then this function outputs one right and for this function this function can be um, computed by a width three branching program it's not very hard to show and um, so it's shown that the this quantity for the tribes function is log n over I think omega of this. So this was shown by Mansoor in the 90s and recently by I think Stein et al. So, so if it's w minus 2 it's actually tight because it's a bit 3 program. All right. Um, so So I'll spend a so I'll spend a lot of time trying to prove this because this is the main structural result. And once we have this properties of the branching program with a very nice seed random generator, which Avi came back came up with in the 80s, will give you the PRG. turns out that the way to prove this is by, so yeah, the general case is not very different from it. So I'll do the general case, but all right. So, so what we'll actually prove is a bound like this for slightly um, a nicer class of branching programs where you can reach every, um, so each reachable node is reachable with probability inverse poly. So, Okay, some notations for branching programs. Um, so for so the layers will be called as v1, v2, so on till I think v n plus one for the last layer. <coughs> so these are the layers of the branching program. Further, so the branching program will be denoted by B and um, so we'll define some sub programs by B arrow to V and B V with an arrow going out of it. So these are sub programs which mean that um, so V is say some node in, in the ith layer. So by this we mean the branching program which starts at the start of B and ends at the ith layer and the only accept node is B, right? So what is this? It's the sub program of B with with V as the only accept node. Yeah. Right, yeah. 
Yeah, that's so. <coughs> okay, so yeah, that's a very nice question. Um, so it turns out that so there is a very nice property of bran branching programs that uh, if you can bound the lower levels really well, and <coughs> sorry. so the pseudorandom generator is the following: that you pick a pseudorandom subset, and um, with the alive with the picked subset, you feed it with a with an epsilon biased uh, generator, and you keep repeating. So what you are actually analyzing is the Fourier spectrum of the branching program under a random restriction. So if it's a P restriction, then at the kth layer, you'd expect weight around, say, P times log n to the k. So if P is like 1 over 100 log n, then at the kth layer, it's like 1 by 100 power k, right? So it, it looks like at the top layers, there is like even less weight, right? Because it's 1 by 100 power k, and as k grows, it's small. But in actuality, you're not using a fully random restriction, but a k-wise random restriction. So the top layers are a problem. Um, it turns out that if for the first order log n layers, you have this really nice bound of 1 by 2 to the k, or 1 by 100 to the k. Sorry? The layers of the levels, sorry. Yeah, levels of the Fourier spectrum. Yes, yes, not layers of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you, yeah. So if you have a really good bound of one by, say, um, or maybe I'll just two power k for um, k in this range, um, one through order. So k is embodied from log n, from large enough constant log n. Then what you can actually prove is that this is enough to show that the mass um, above this is bounded by poly n. And it's very, it's, at least the proof here is very specific to branching programs. This was known before. It, it was, uh, yeah, this was known before by, <coughs> by, uh, by uh, this work of uh, Stein, K. Vadan, and Rengold, yeah. So um, it's, so this is known for, <coughs> So there's more structure you need to assume. Like you need to, you need that the class of branching programs that you're, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> sorry. So the class of branching programs that you're dealing with is closed under restrictions and under subprograms. So for example, if you're dealing with regular programs, then it's not clean. But for permutation or if you're dealing with these things, then it's, it turns out that for getting the seed length that I have written down, <coughs> we'll deal with a class of branching programs which is not closed, but still you can get around it. So there's nice properties of branching programs you can use. And yeah, we extend things of uh, Stein K. Yeah. Right. So. <coughs> Yes, I'm. Right. Yes, exactly. So this is a start node, and it goes to the end with the end accept node being the usual as b. Right. So um, an easy claim is this: that b of x is summation of v in v i of So this is true for any for any i. You can just split the branching program into whichever it goes. Yeah, there's nothing non-trivial here. <coughs> and and another useful claim is this, which is.
So I'll need some more notation, which is that by PV, PV is the probability that a random walk so PV is the probability that it goes through V and by <coughs> beta V, beta V is the accepting probability of this probe. So if you start at V, what's the probability that you'll accept? Okay. So these are some things that we'll use. So it turns out that if you're just looking at level one Fourier coefficients, then it's easy to express um, B hat of I in terms of the Fourier coefficients of the i player, which is It's the same. Yeah. yeah. So we'll. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You really need to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for four years. Yeah. Yeah. For. for yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's ordered. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So for the Fourier spectrum thing, we'll create from x1 to x1. So <coughs> so this is the claim and so the proof is pretty simple. It's so so if you just write b of x is this and you split it at the ith layer and <coughs> then write the Fourier expansion, then B hat of, I will just be, so this is summation of B, V I. So this will just be the summation of B is in V I of the expected value of So it's just, um, so each term is B arrow till V of X times B, B arrow of X times minus one power XI, right? So the observation is that this thing does not depend on XI, right? So you can just, you know, you can just condition on that being one or zero and um, you get this claim, right? So this is this expectation of this condition on, you know, B this, of x being one times probability that that's one, which is exactly B B. Right? Right. So okay. um, I think you guys are familiar with the notation. So I'll just remove it. So for now, what we are trying to do is um, prove theorem one for um, k equals to one. Right. So for width w and k, yeah, for k equals to one. And <coughs> so the proof is, so the high level idea of the proof is this, that we'll show that there is a really nice class of branching programs, which, it, which we call locally monotone branching programs. And it turns out that if you just look at this quantity, um, summation of b hat of i, the absolute values, so it's achieved by one of these programs. So it's just enough to prove this bound for uh, locally monotone branching programs. So, <coughs> um, so let me introduce what locally monotone branching programs are. So it's exactly what you think probably, it's locally monotone. So. So if you look at any, so fix an ordering of the, of the, of the states of the nodes in a layer, right? So for example, one way we could order them is by the, so if this is V, 
we could order them by beta v's, which is the probability of acceptance if you start at b. And you just break ties arbitrarily. Like if beta v's are the same, you. So what you mean, which is this is the one you chose? Yeah, the, this is the one we choose, right. yes. So you order them by their. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Right, yeah. And break ties arbitrarily. And then <coughs> a branching program is called locally monotone with respect to this ordering if, um, if you look at the one node and the zero node, you want the one, sorry, the one uh, arrow and the zero arrow coming out of every node, you want the one arrow to be at least as high as the zero arrow, right? So this, so for, for example, if there is something which is zero and something which is one, then this is not locally monotone. But this is locally, I mean, this does not uh, valid the criteria. Great. So note that locally monotone branching programs need not compute um, monotone functions. They're, I mean, you, you need to be clever, but I think you can compute parity as well with maybe with three uh, locally monotone. So, um, <coughs> and further, these programs are notorious in the sense that they're not, so this locally monotone property is not, uh, not preserved under restrictions as well. So, I mean, if you fix this bit, then, and if this was a locally monotone program, it's easy to construct examples where, you know, you go below and go up here. So, it's not locally monotone. To be careful when you are dealing with these things. Great. So, so given a branching program, um, there is an easy way of locally monotonizing it, which is first order the states, and then if a particular um, node does not satisfy the locally monotone property, then just flip the edges, right? So, and you keep doing them, and if you think about it, then the order in which you are flipping the edges does not matter, because the ordering of the states is by beta v's, and if you are flipping it, you do not change the probability of reaching a node, right? Because you are not, uh, under the uniform distribution, you are not changing the number of paths that go to a node. They are computing a different function. So whenever we say we are locally monotonizing a branching program, we are doing that, right? We are just flipping the edges. And um, <coughs> so, so there's a really nice lemma called the collision lemma for this monotone branching program which was um, proved by Brody Verbin when they were analyzing some things called as coin games with respect to branching program. And the collision lemma is the following, that if you look at, so you look at a branching program B, which is locally monotone, and you look at two layers. So in fact, they show that locally monotone branching programs are extremal for these coin games. So the idea is this that, so the claim is this, the collision lemma is this, that if you look at any layer and you look at the, uh, at the graphs, say, G, so suppose this is the ith layer, right? So you look at gi zero and gi one. So as by GI zero, you mean the graph, which is by just looking at the edges, which are labeled zero, and by GI one, you're looking at the graph, but the edges are just labeled one, right? So the claim is that either there is a collision in one of these two graphs, or there is an identity permutation between the states from this layer to this layer. So 
there is something like this probably, so there is a collision. So if you have to adjust which point to the same thing with the same label, then it's a collision. So the claim is that either there is a collision or, you know, you, there is no effect of the ith bit. It's just, um, just an identity permutation from the states here to the states here. So, uh, so what's the proof for this? It's, it's actually pretty simple. So suppose there is no collision in GI zero, right? So, which means that since there are W nodes here, W nodes here, it's a matching. And <coughs> so suppose, For now, suppose there is no collision here. It's this application of pigeonhole where you want to say that, you know, this one node, so the one node from each um, node goes at least as high as the zero, right? So for any, so for at any, um, I don't know, height, if the one node does not go to itself, then it goes up. And now for the remaining things, there are lesser number of charges. So there has to be a collision in one of them. And if there is no, then each of these zeros and ones are just pointing to a particular state. Right? So that's the collision learning. Right, yeah, so. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so it's a matching and you can always reorder according to the matching. Order of the accepting probabilities here. It will. It basically it reduces to. Um, so yeah, I see what you're saying. So suppose this maps to this and yeah. this maps. Right. So, uh, yeah, so for the general thing, the proof. It's a slight, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is one obvious case where you can rule it out and as Avi says, what if the matching is different, where right? it does not respect the ordering? Then, so from what I recall, I think this was, so it, you can reduce it to this, maybe. Um, yeah, the, the, So um, let's assume the collision lemma and um, yeah. So <coughs> it's, a, it's a very nice observation about locally monotone branching programs and it turns out that this is crucial for us to prove um, this at least for layer one. So our, our claim is the following. So let V be any vertex in the ith layer. And for B, and let B prime be the monotonized B. B prime is the branching program which you get after monotonizing the branching program B. Worse for yeah, exactly, yeah. So, and the observation starts out with this that, um, so suppose you just look at 
you know this this quantity absolute value of this then this is in fact equal to So it's saying that if you want to, if you care about the absolute values, then it's enough to look at the monotonized version of. So the plus is going to be that the monotonized value is the absolute value of this one, right? Yeah. It's actually simpler than so. Yeah, so it's so what is B V uh, hat of I? So V is in the ith layer, right? So uh, yeah, I can I think I can remove these. So V is here and so it has a, you know, probably a, so the states are ordered by beta Vs and it has, it goes to V0 and probably V1 here, right? So this is a zero transition, this is a one transition. Then um, is the probability that, you know, this branching program V0 of X is one minus probability VV, the absolute value of this, right? Uh, with the half, this depends on the XI essentially, right? So because it's expectation of this, so since we are locally monotonizing this, sorry, let, let, it's easier to better to write down without the. Will it be the other way? So all you want to say is that if you're monotonizing it, this probability will always be higher than this probability, right? Yeah, where is the, so the higher probability is the uh, I think they should be the, the other way around probably for this to work here. Increases it. Right. So because it's minus one for xi, so this right, right. So if you locally monotonize it, then this quantity will always be larger than this quantity, and hence this claim is true. And once you have this, then um, then essentially, um, if you look at b hat of i, so you can write it as the absolute value of V V times So this quantity always upper bounds this. No, no, no. So this is just sh showing that you know uh, monotone branching, locally monotone branching programs are extrable for um, for this quantity when you want to say you have a summation over i's from one through n. Because now you want to prove bounds for locally monotone. Yeah. You should. Yeah, I can recall. Right. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it's it's a really nice thing about <laughs> monotone things. So yeah. But yeah. Okay. Uh, 
uh, all right, now that we have this, maybe I'll use the top board. So, so, should I, do you guys want a break or, okay, maybe, a, um, maybe let's do a bound for the locally monotone thing and then take a break. Okay, so now let's try to really do with W locally monotone branching program, right? And the base case will be width two, which if I have uh, yeah. uh, right. Yes. So, yeah, it's induction on W and the claim is this. the bias of the branching program. So, so the as as you might have guessed, it's induction on W and the way we want to apply induction is by um, random restrictions. So and this is where the collision lemma comes in. So suppose you have you have this branching program. The base case. Um, yes, the base case is two, and it uses arguments. So you can actually look at the. I'll do the base case maybe slightly later. So it does not use anything about. Right, so, so for the base case when it's, yeah, so it's when it's two, then you want to prove a bound of P times log one over P. And we'll, we'll prove that after looking at this. So, so the width is W and So since we are trying to prove a bound on this, we, we assume that there is um, no layer where it's the, so there is a collision in every layer. There is no identity layer. Because if there is an identity layer, then there is no effect, right? So it's just p hat of i is zero. So, um, so there's a collision in every layer. And the idea is based on a paper of Steinberger who introduces these, um, random restrictions which are different from, which are slightly different from what we usually see in computer science. So, um, <coughs> so the random restriction is in the following way, that you have a parameter A, which you think of as, say, um, say no, order log n, right? So this will be the, common difference in an arithmetic progression, A. And, and there is a random variable J, which is in zero through A minus one, right? So the random restriction proceeds in the following way, that you randomly pick J, and then you restrict, sorry, you keep 
alive all those layers which are um, which evaluate to j modulo a. So if you look at the ith layer, compute i modulo a. If it's j, then you um, do not. So you restrict all um, all the layers here, and then and you uniformly set the variables here, right? So so notice that the probability that each layer is alive is one over a, right? Because you pick j uniformly random, right? So um, and now since we have assumed that each layer has a collision in it, then the probability that um, the probability that there is a collision the in so so suppose you are you know uh, looking at two consecutive layers, right? And you have uniformly set this. So there is a collision here. You do not know if it's a zero collision or a one collision, right? If you have randomly set it, then the probability half there will be a collision here. So the probability that there is no collision here is pretty small. It's one by two to the a. So a collision happens with probability at least one by two to the a or two to the a minus one. And once you have fixed j, then these are, you know, independent events, right? So, um, and what happens if there is? So this is a probability that, you know, you'll see at least one collision in this. And if there is a collision here, then suppose you know there was a zero collision here. Then the claim is that only so if this was width w, the claim is that here the number of reachable nodes is just w minus one. Right? Because you know once once you have fixed this to zero, the number of reachable nodes here is just w minus one. And then since you have fixed all the remaining variables as well, you cannot reach more than w minus one layer. Right? So that's the really nice um, use of this collision and width reduction. So So the thing is, once you hit a, an alive layer, then it can, you know, again spread out and reach like both zero and so you kind of lose that. So, um, all right. So what you do with the live layer is you end up saying, ah, so there, there was a reduced w minus one. Right. So. The claim is that with very high probability, you'll see very few layers which are uh, with w plus one. So suppose you want to calculate the probability that there are um, b b layers, b alive layers of with w plus one, right? Sorry, uh, w. Okay, yeah, right, w. Right, yeah, yeah, a is log n, so it's one over a large polynomial. So I mean, yeah, you choose n, choose b layers maybe, and you do a union bound over of this. So this is negligible. Volume. So what you can further do is, you know, condition on the event that there are just b um, bad layers. Maybe think of BS log n. Uh, you s you're saying we can union bound over. Right. 
Yeah, I think you're, I don't know why he leaves. Oh, no, no. You spread out, right? But yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, you're right. We can push this down there sufficiently. Okay, so yeah, you can assume that this is a width w minus one program. And once you have a width w minus one program, the so call the restricted program maybe um, b prime and <coughs> B prime is the restricted program. And the claim is that, so, So this is it, yeah. So the claim is that, you know, you can relate the Fourier coefficients of the original branching program to the restricted branching program, B prime. And this is a simple uh, Fourier analytic lemma, which says that, okay, I think it's better to write it in this way that So the general claim is that if you look at, you know, if you look at a random restriction, and if you look at the asset Fourier coefficient of this restricted program, or this restricted function, and you you take expectation over, you know, the randomness and your restriction, then this is equal to the original program's Fourier coefficient times the probability that this variable is alive, and it's easy to see that you know if if i is alive then this expectation is exactly equal to this because you know you're uniformly setting the variables here and if this is not alive then you are essentially computing par uh, correlation with a parity which you know the function does not depend on that variable so it's zero so no 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 yeah this is yeah this is true for any function Right, so, um, oh, I see. So since we are dealing with a locally monotone thing, we can be, we don't need to care about absolute value. So what we are looking at is bounding this quantity, right? Where this is over one through n. And now, um, since since this is a branching, pro so with very high probability, this is a branching program with um, with w w minus one. Um, so you can just plug in the bounds for from our claim, and you get. So, and this is exactly equal to the probability that B accepts. So, plus there will be some negligible term where 
um, it actually did not shrink to uh, W minus 2, but you can make it sufficiently small enough. Right? And to bound this, you multiply it by a factor of A, and you pick up this log X. Oh, this is concave, so you can just yes, right. So, so this proves for uh, for the first level of Fourier proofs. Okay, let's t maybe take a five-minute break and then. Yeah, you are right about the collision lemma. I looked at it like two, three weeks back, and I'm not able to <laughs> recall how they enforce that it's the same mapping. Uh, yeah, it, well, it's probably a pigeonhole argument. It's a pigeonhole uh, argument, yeah. It's a little more subtle yeah. than what you said. Right, yeah. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so you can assume there are permutations from which there are different, and you sort of have to go higher again in some sense. It has some kind of so restriction. It has to be a collision. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. one will always be. Yeah. So there has to be the same mapping. It actually has to be the same mapping. And now it's, uh, mm. now, now you, now you have to be able to say it's the same mapping because these two have to align. Right. If, if they were sort of according to increasing yeah, order, I see. they yeah. cannot They be cannot align, yeah. It's fewer than one to increase. Right, I see. I mean, you do get some L1 bounds. I think Mansur uses, like you can Mansour use, the yeah, in the LMN thing. Uh, Probably, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I can try to think of different.
Yes, sir. Um, all right, so uh, let's now try to prove a bond on the kth layer, kth level of Fourier coefficients, assuming that um, you have a bound of delta on PV for each vertex V. So we reach any any reachable vertex is three strict quality at least delta. And it turns out that it's enough to fool this class of branching programs and you pay do not, you do not pay too much like. In MNW, yeah, right, exactly. So um, the proof, so the idea is to do induction on K. So we have proved this for k equals to 1 and now we want to do induction on k. So so for any s which is of size k, um, you know you can write it as summation over v is in vi. same decomposition that you want to use. So uh, I've not said what I is here. So so, so for any set let you know let I so I is the largest element along. So pick the largest element along. And then you would have this which is summation of some xj where j is an s minus i. s minus 1 power x i. So, so the idea is you know you split it such that this function just depends on this and this function on whether if you want, so note that what we proved there was for locally monotone branching programs and right. I is the largest. I so that's the, yeah, you need to choose the layer. Yeah, yeah. Right. So the layer is just the last one. Yeah. Right. So. So yeah, just the xith thing appears here and everything else appears before this. And you sort of want to, you know, break it up into something which, a program which comes till here and a program which uh, depends just on xi and nothing else on this, right? So yeah, with this intuition, Sorry, yeah. So one thing I wanted to mention was that now B is no longer uh, locally monotone. So B is a general branching program. So just for uh, K equals to one, we knew that it's, you know, the maximum is achieved by locally monotone programs. And proving it for locally monotone proved the bond for any branching program. But now for layer level K, we start out with a general branching program of width W. Right, so, so this, I mean, you can see is bounded by V is in VI J. Something like this. So using this, you want to estimate this. Well, uh, 
of this visible. So this summation over S such that S is k b hat of S. This can be bounded by uh, a summation over. So I'm slightly overestimating, but it's it's not bad because we'll have this thing. So this is so you are pushing the i, which is the last layer, and then you have a summation over then b i. S prime, which is a subset, so it should be a subset of first i minus one. But you again, it does. You can overestimate and you know s such that the size of sorry, s prime such that the size of s prime is k minus one uh, of the absolute value of. Times sorry, S prime plus of I. And now you want to use induction on this term. So, so for convenience, you know, let's have this variable T, which is. Which is what is raised to the power k. So t is this c log n w minus 2 log 1 over delta. So we bound this by t power k summation over i from 1 through n, summation of v is k. Right. RT, sorry. Yeah. Of you know this absolute value of times log one over P B right by induction hypothesis. Now you can use that bound and we can just take this out like log 1 over delta. Since we know that each PV is lower bounded by delta, now this quantity looks very familiar. This is, so we want to say that. So, uh, right, exactly. Thanks. Yes. So this is um, bounded by t power k minus one. So since you're just looking at layer i again, you can just you know for this estimate you can again monotonize it, and you're looking at the level one Fourier coefficients of a monotone branching program. Right, so you can bound this by times whatever bound we prove for the monotone thing, which is W minus 2. And so if you're monotonizing it, again, you do not, since you're just flipping out things, you're not, you know, these PVs of B and PVs of the monotonized branching program are also the same because, you know, you're just under a uniform distribution, you're just relabeling, so the number of connections will not change. So, so in fact, you can use this bound, and you end up with this times c times log one over p. So, yeah, that's what is. So, this P is the accepting original program. Yes. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, now 
you take one of the log one over deltas inside t, leave one here, leave the p here, and also take this. So this times this is t, right? So this is bounded by t power k p log one over p. So you get the appropriate bound. Um, so I claim that we prove a bound of you know log n power w k for general branching program, and seems like we are only proving it for uh, these branching programs which have delta bounded by lower bounded by one by inverse poly. So that's just, you know, so, okay, suppose you locally monotonize it, you remove this and you have this, right? So, so recall that, you know, when you, when you do not have this i1 through n, you just fix an i and you just look at summation of b's and this of this quantity. This is exactly b hat of i, right? So, um, so you. Um, so yeah, for general these uh, sorry for general branching programs also, you can you can bound this summation in a slightly different way. So um, here I ignore this. So essentially, it's more complicated, and you need to take some threshold for the PVs. So if PVs, so the annoying thing is this log one over PV, right? So if log one over PV can be pretty large, and you know if delta is Two to the minus omega n, or I don't know, then it's pretty large. So, so even then you can bound it, and it it requires more work. But and also it gives you worse bounds. So, and we show that it's enough to pull this class of function. So you know I'll just show this. I think given all this, one can actually. So it's more brute force work. You need to classify PVs into which is you have a threshold. If PV is greater than this delta, you have this. If PV is less than delta, then you say that PV is so small that it actually dominates this sum. So you can do it. Uh, under the uniform distribution, you're saying, yeah. But then. You need to show it also. Uh, you're saying anything which pulls. But somehow you want to say that yeah. your pseudorandom distribution also, it's negligible for the pseudorandom distribution also. Yeah. Pull the, uh, yeah. 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 I think that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what we say. So. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so let's, so I'll slightly change gears now and talk about the pseudo random generator. So let me briefly sketch what our view is saying. So, so let's. So N W delta R O R O B P's are all Friedman's branching programs of length n with W, such that each node is you know reachable with plurality at least delta. And suppose let B pull this class with 
error of silence. Now the class is unknown. So, yeah, for this. Suppose this happens, then d pools, you know, n w zero R O B Q squared. Something like this, like this f. I think it's. And the yeah, the idea is exactly you know proof sketch is this that um, you essentially you start out with a program B which is in this N W zero class, right? And you go through a series of relabelings and get to a program B prime which is in N W delta through B one, B two, so on. So this is B zero and this is B n. And at the ith stage, you just relabel uh, the edges between in the ith layer between V i and V i plus one. And what you do is essentially uh, you do this relabeling where So you have a bad set of nodes, which which are reachable with priority less than two delta, right? And you want to somehow say that you can you know, relabel things so that um, the remaining branching program is so the relabel branching program till the ith layer does not have any of these bad nodes. So, I mean, <coughs> what you do is at the ith stage of this relabeling, if there is any vertex uh, which is, you know, suppose there is a node here which the probability of reaching this node is below 2 delta, then it has two edges going out of it. You just pick, a, pick any vertex of your, any node of your choice here. And just send both the both the arrows to the same thing, right? You do it for all nodes which are reachable with priority less than two delta. So, from bi to bi plus one, you just do it for this layer, and you keep going. And at the end, you end up with bn when you have done this for all the layers. And you want to claim that you know this new branching program belongs to this class. And you do it through induction, and you show that um, at time step i, all nodes up to i are reachable with probability at least delta. The point is that you know. Uh, so if this node was reachable with probability less than two delta, it was reachable with probability at least delta, right? Because we have you know by induction we have done it till here. And now since you are, you know, clubbing since it's between delta and two delta, and you are sending both both of them to the same place. No, this node is still reachable with uh, probability. So there will be new nodes which are unreachable, but you don't care about. So you keep doing this, and now you want to show that. You know. So clearly, B n is fooled by D. You want to show that B zero is also fooled by D, and it's not very difficult, because the point is that each of these, so the probability that B and B and differ is only when you reach one of these nodes. And the probability of reaching one of these nodes is two delta. And by union bounding, it's N W times two delta, which is still small. So that's the proof sketch. All right. So I'll spend the final 15 minutes talking about the pseudo random generator.
CRG for unordered branching programs. And the construction is simple. So it's base, it's an iterative construction. And what you do is, so you have some parameters P. So this is, so this P corresponds to the random restriction. So you pick each coordinate with probability P. And you would want to match P to this quantity T that you have so that, you know, you can bound the Fourier spectrum. So P is say one by two T and T is um, log n to the W minus one, right? So um, further we cannot afford a random restriction where it picks each coordinate independently with probability P. So you want a K wise independence where K is log N over epsilon for a target error, order epsilon. And somehow we want to show that, you know, even k-wise independence works. So. k-wise independence is for each uh, Right. Okay. So, or exactly. Or right. So, you know, you first sample T1 from this distribution D, where D is uh, k comma p comma too many parameters, maybe k p delta independent distribution. So what this means is that, so it's on 0, 1 to the n, and the ones indicate that you're picking the subset t, right? So, so if you look at any i, which is a subset of n and the size of i is bounded by k, then the probability that any string say z, which has, you know, r zeros and so the probability that t1 equals to z, t1 projected onto i is z is where um, n0 is the number of ones in z and, sorry, that's a bad notation. And similarly, n0 is the number of zeros in. Yes, if you just have to look at k. And you pay some delta because you want almost k wise independence, right? So this can be generated with a search function k k is a mass log n. So you need like k log one over p plus uh, how much? This kind of but just this part. So yes, k is log n, and p is this. So this is like a log log n thing. However, this delta is pretty small. You want delta to be uh, ah, I see. So right. I'm sorry. What th this one? It's a
So, and <coughs> once you pick your subset, you want to feed it with an epsilon biased generator. So that takes again C tenth log n, log n over epsilon. So the second step would be yeah, epsilon. So you are describing a, you are describing a linear algorithm. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you are doing it as an algorithm. It's an algorithm. It's an yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. yeah. Yes. So that's yeah. why you are writing it. You right. are just saying from what you are saying from the beginning up to the last part. Right. Part, yes. Then Keep repeating. Yeah. Log n, log log n, yeah, right, yeah. So, yeah, so the high level thing is you pick a pseudo random subset and use a pseudo random distribution for the coordinates which belong to this subset. And the second pseudo random distribution that we use is you just need uh, almost k wise independence, which you can generate using epsilon by space. So, each, I each iteration you are using log n, log log n bits. And how many times do you want to do it? Well, um, you know, you expect that with high priority to pick around, say, p n, p times n coordinates, right? So you're left with one minus p n coordinates. And if you want to repeat it for l times, and maybe finally reach log one over epsilon, which you can directly just fit in uniformly random bits. So so L is around l log n over P, right? So you repeat for um, for these many rounds, and each round you are paying log n times log log n seed. So that gives you the final generator. So once you pick the subset, um, so the pseudo random, the target distribution say you're wanting to do is x, which is on n bits. So this on this one is you use an epsilon biased generator. And this you can show that it happens with high priority, so just add it to the error when you, when your generator sees that after random restriction there were too many unfixed coordinates. So, and the proof that this works is through, hybrid, through a hybrid argument and at each step you want to show that um, so let's look at the first step and suppose our pseudo random generator just does this, that it picks its first pseudo random subset P1 and feeds it with epsilon, with an epsilon bias generator. But the remaining coordinates, it uses uniform bits, right? So this is the, you know, n bit string, the distribution that we are, the target distribution that we are trying to make. So suppose this was P1, right? You see it randomly pick P1. And now you, now we use an epsilon biased
generated to fill this. And you'd expect maybe the size of this to be order of pn with hyper, maybe say with high priority. And the next round. So even for this round, you know, right. you could use the, you know, if you want to extend the scope. Oh, yeah, yes. Your class. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's it's very yeah. It it will take a lot. No. 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 It's not here at all. So, yeah. So that's the generator, and let's try to prove that one step works. Right. If you can prove one step works, the claim is that you you keep doing this hybrid argument, and you and you. And at each step, if you incur an error of epsilon over n, then you are done essentially. So what we want to prove is that um, when x is drawn from the uniform distribution minus so this is the notation I'm using. So t is the Let's just call it t because we are just doing one round. So you are restricting b to the coordinates in the index by t, and u is the assignment to the variables outside t, right? So we pick t from this um, this kp delta distribution. U is uniform on the coordinates outside t. And x is this epsilon by a space that's called as dx. So you want we want to prove that this is bounded by I don't know some you, you want to do some kind of union bound. So if your target error is epsilon, you want to prove this kind of a bound. Right? So and yeah. The claim is that the Fourier bound so what is easy is that if instead of this epsilon by space, okay, then you're, yeah, if you had uniform bits, then you're not essentially doing anything. So the claim is that, you know, if T instead of being this k wise independent distribution, it was in fact, you know, you pick each coordinate independently with probability P, then this is, this is easy. This is easy to prove given our Fourier bounds. So why is that true? Well, um, so we'll use a fact about epsilon by spaces that um, fact or lemma or whatever is this that um, suppose you have a function, okay, so expected value of x of any function under the uniform distribution minus its expectation when x is from this epsilon by space say dx. Yeah, it's over all the bits. So this is bounded by the by the L1 norm of f times epsilon, right? So I mean, if your function has really small L1 norm, then epsilon by spools it, right? So in our case, if t was, you know, this instead of being k-wise independent, it was actually independent then if you if we if you look at this function um,
So, yes. So this is an epsilon bias oh, for any epsilon bias generator. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sure. So this is a pseudo random generator against parities, and it fools parities with error epsilon. Right. Um, okay. So the claim is this: that you know, if you just look at the L1 norm of this function of B restricted to T and the remaining bits are uniformly chosen where T chooses its bits um, independently. Then this is, this is bounded by um, P power K L1 K of this branching program. So by L1 K, I mean at the kth lambda, right? So because this is the probability that a set will be alive under T, right? And then, you know, if you chose, and this is what? So for this quantity, we have a bound of some T power K, where T is log into the W. Yes, P was like one over two T, right? So you have a geometric progression and it's, it's just order one. So you can easily fool this function using an epsilon bias theory. But the, but the problem now is that you have this kind of a bound only um, till, you know, you're using say two K wise independence. So you have a bound like this up to level two K. And um, and the and what we show is that once you have a bound till a reasonable layer, which is so, if you use k-wise independence with k, which is order log n, then in fact you can show that um, by proofs which are similar to some of the proofs by split. So I've given you some idea of how to split Fourier coefficients, like you look at the last layer. So you want to induct on the size, you want to do an induction on K to prove that uh, you maintain the bound. Because still, you know, if K is log N, order log N, then you already have inverse poly bounds, right? So, so if you're looking at say layer, I don't know, K plus J, you, you break it into K and J, you have a bound for K and you also have a bound for J. Right, because both of them are less than k plus j, right? And you show that the amount of summations that you're doing is not too large. So, um, For the original branching program, so 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 yeah, very large. Yeah. So the reason is that. Uh, So I think it's some, okay, so one thing you're showing is that if you, if you look at this function, this restricted function, so, you know, with high priority, so using Markov, you can show that with high priority up to layer K, this branching program, each of these levels is bounded by this one by two power K poly N. Oh, the, uh, the original branching program, yeah. Right. 
Tu kan dua. Saying, Wait, is it treatment? Uh, you know, for oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 that's yeah, that's right. That's right. So this is the kind of weight you have. You can probably, yeah, that's the kind. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's. Yeah. All right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, yeah. So. Right. So if you have exact, uh, so if T indep independently pick each coordinate, then you have a bound like this, and using the structure of branching programs, we can actually show that, you know, if you have a good enough bound for the lower levels, then you can actually bound, uh, you have good bounds for the whole L1 thing with high priority. And that's enough to show that um, at each, so at each iteration, you do not incur too much error. So um, that gives the PRG. Um, so there are many open questions left here, so can you get better dependence on W? So um, so the L1 bounds that we get are tight, but uh, the characterization of epsilon by spaces is this, that you don't need to fool the L1 bound. You need just sandwiching approximators with low L1 weights. So maybe you can get around with better ideas. Uh, 